Also, in this half hour, we're going to stay on for a while. We'll be having a press conference here at the Kennedy Space Center. George Page, the launch director, will be telling of his experiences on this brilliant, brilliant launch. Tom, you wanted to talk about the... Uh, the configuration of the of the Columbia. Oh, we were just getting into that. Yeah. That's right. And this is a this is the heart of it. And Joe Kerwin is a mission specialist. We'll have a lot to do with this in the future. And at uh, oh, in about uh, 20 minutes from now, we should get some television pictures as they come over the United States and begin by remote control to test out a series of 13 latches that are down through here that hold these doors in place. These doors are critical because when they open up, and we'll talk more about this. Uh, they have radiators built into them, and the radiators throw all the heat generated by the systems on board, throw all that heat into space. They cannot continue unless these doors can be opened successfully and the radiators function, because everything would overheat and begin to malfunction. <coughs> Just so. Is that a fair summary? That is exactly right. Now, this space eventually, now for now, it's empty, but eventually that is the heart of it because it will be filled with all manner of things maybe a space laboratory, which is being developed by the European Space Agency. Uh, in the fall of this year, they'll begin to go up with some canisters in there. People have bought special packages and things, and mm -hmm. they'll be able to have some people on board who will conduct experiments for them within that. Uh, eventually, they expect to launch satellites from here. Many deployable satellites. Those will be our uh, first real payloads. I know more about these things than I ever thought possible. LEOs are low Earth satellites that you'll have. Yeah, I'm here <coughs> approaching the threshold. <laughs> <laughs> low Earth satellites, that's a, that's a low orbit, and then they'll have some that they can launch that'll, be, uh, that'll go out into a higher orbit as well. There are all manner of uh, uses planned by NASA. Not everyone agrees that it's going to work as well as you all think that it does. It's going to cost, what, $35 million to rent the whole space altogether? Uh, a little less than that, I think. Uh, we have Jim Cummins standing by now with, uh, with some guests. Jim, are you there? Jim, you're on. Life has pretty much returned to normal here on the banks of the Banana River. Most people now have gone back to sleep. They're resting. Uh, they're building up their strength for the drive back and the traffic jam that waits for them. I'm standing here with Bill Haynes, a man who has seen this launch at least 20 times before. He is an orbiter project engineer, one of six in the NASA program, and they, and they, uh, and they simulate uh, launches. How did this one compare to the ones you simulated? Very quickly. It was just by the, by the book. It was just the way we wrote the procedure. It was very uh, close to uh, what we expected, and we're very happy to see it go. Okay. And I imagine you're, you're nervous about the rest of the uh, mission. Oh, yes. We'll be uh, anxiously awaiting the landing in, on uh, Wednesday and Edwards. Yes. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Haynes. Back to you, John. Thank you very much. Let's go now to uh, the Kennedy Space Center launching area here where we have George Page, who is the flight director, a very happy man try to catch this time, except for Dave Dooling, who is down here. We do have a problem with the rows. The, in order for the mic people to be able to get to you, uh, we have to have people not standing in the aisles. Um, Charlie, right down here in the first row, Dave Dooling from the Huntsville Times. Okay, obviously for the folks in Huntsville, I guess the way I should phrase this is, there, was there anything in the tank or the engine or the booster performance that was just even a little bit off the money? Dave, I think you got home free. Everything worked great. Okay, we'll take one right over here in this aisle. Uh, Luke Hope, Minneapolis Tribune, just take that feather. Was there anything at all whether uh, that did not uh, meet your ex, uh, your, your plan, where you got either more thrust or more of any type of thing other than what was planned or less? Well, I, I can't uh, speak for the data yet. We haven't looked at it, but personally, I got a lot more than I thought I was going to get today. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we'll go over to this side. Whoops. Okay, we're right here. Uh, in the meantime, then we'll go to you, Dan. Uh, Everly Driscoll, ICA. Uh, George, what what did uh, Capcom mean when he said uh, uh, Columbia looking a little hot, calls could come too early? Was that just uh, overthrottling or? I, I didn't hear the call. At what time did it occur? Um, it was right before SRB separation. Oh, I think probably what he was saying that the performance may have been 
a little higher than expected. Therefore, we were reaching the uh, altitude and speed that we were supposed to get a little early. Okay, Dan Fiorucci. Uh, did liftoff occur at four seconds past the hour? It seemed to me that T0 was reached uh, four seconds after uh, 7 o'clock. You know, I'll tell you the truth, I goofed. I didn't even check before I came over here to find out what it was. Uh, the, I was happy. Whatever it was, I was happy with it. <laughs> Here at Mission Control, we are waiting the first television transmission from space to see how those cargo bay doors operate. They will be opened and closed twice during this mission. And as we have been saying, it's important for them to open and it's important for them to close. They must open if we are to have a full flight of two days. They must close if they are to get back from out of space uh, into the atmosphere. If they fail to close, of course, the space shuttle would not be able to re-enter the Earth's atmosphere. Uh, and uh, that would amount to a catastrophe. I must say one thing, uh, Frank, uh, while I'm thinking about it, that early on in this flight, uh, here at Mission Control, control, here at mission control hour, the word was go, go, go. Uh, it seems that everything is operating on schedule. Uh, here is shuttle control. The uh, first uh, television transmission uh, should occur at, uh, or should be received at one hour, 36 minutes, uh, 22 seconds. Uh, this, the uh, payload bay door uh, opening. Uh, this, this will occur uh, over the uh, states. Uh, we also have a report from the surgeon that it, at external tank separation, uh, heart rates uh, read as follows. For Commander John Young, 110, and for pilot uh, Bob Crippen, uh, 130. We're at uh, one hour, 23 minutes mission last time. This is Shuttle Control Houston. Well, that's interesting, uh, Gene Cernan, that uh, John Young's heartbeat went up a little uh, higher at the uh, separation of the external tank from the orbiter than it did from the launch from the pad. Well, he's a uh, he's pretty big, busy man uh, during that, that launch time uh, from the pad. But uh, as I said, uh, I think John will admit it to himself, you know, if you don't get a little apprehensive now and then, you don't really understand the problem. That external tank separation was a big, big thing for them. Uh, had they not been able to get... Uh, that tank off, uh, it would have been a very critical situation. And at that point, too, uh, they, they were gliding, weren't they? Oh, yeah, they were coasting. They were in zero gravity. Once that main engine shut down, you go from, uh, they were at about uh, approximately three Gs or three times the for force of gravity. Uh, and uh, as soon as that, ta that engine shuts down, they go immediately into zero gravity. And little things, uh, pencils and a few things that you haven't secured start floating, floating around. And that's when your stomach, uh, your, your stomach just goes from about down in the middle of your belly, up through your throat, and then slowly works its way down, down again. It's like going over a, a hump in a road. A very big hump. Well, so far, everything has worked well. Everything has separated. The SRBs, those solid rocket, uh, rocket boosters, uh, have been sighted, but not yet recovered. They did come down, we understand, about 16 miles or so from the uh, waiting recovery ships. And of course, they will be returned and uh, refurbished to be used on later shuttle flights. We are one hour and 24 minutes and 55 seconds into the mission of Columbia. By the way, speaking of the uh, SRBs and their recovery, a Russian uh, trawler that had been in the uh, recovery area earlier Sunday was ordered to leave the area and was escorted out by a United States Coast Guard cutter. A Russian trawler, probably a fishing vessel, and they sometimes have some fishing vessels with some very sophisticated equipment uh, that uh, frequently have little to do with fish. Well, Frank... We, uh, I, I, I don't think we really didn't want anyone to get hurt down there. You know, those boosters can fall on somebody. We certainly wouldn't want them to fall on a Russian trawler. Not at 60 miles an hour. <laughs> they can put a big dent in the electronic ear, <laughs> as well as the fish hold, which it, which well, it doesn't have. Yes, I remember there's, uh, there's, during several years ago, and he might still be out there, there was always a Russian uh, submarine parked uh, uh, just uh, offshore in Guam to uh, monitor the takeoff of uh, the B-52s from Guam during the Vietnam War. Sometimes you, you're able to see the thing out there, you know. It was not very far away on station. And uh, well, there, real there were fishing boats around that one, too. Realistically, I, I assume they probably got some pretty good offshore photography of our launch, sure. uh, as they have in the past. And again, uh, you know, this is... Our launch is open to the world. Uh, everyone's got a right to watch it and take whatever pictures they want, and I suppose they do, too, offshore. 
And of course, they don't believe, uh, Gene and Frank, that we don't use secret electronic frequencies on these kind of missions, which we don't use. They could tune in to the same uh, high frequency and uh, VHF uh, equipment you can buy in Radio Shack or any uh, uh, amateur store and well, get it's there... the same, same equipment. Jules, is, is there no provision, and Jane, too, would you tell me, is there no provision for any private communication between the spacecraft and uh, Houston? There, there oh, I'm is, sure there is, Gene. There, there is, Frank. There are provisions for, uh, for uh, private communications. There always has been in the past. Uh, uh, you question how private is private. Uh, anyone can pick up certain frequencies uh, with the proper uh, communications equipment anywhere in the world. But uh, when we think of private, we think of... Uh, private in a sense uh, to talk and discuss some things that we would like to come up with answers for before, for instance, uh, uh, the rest of the world solves our problem for us without really knowing what it is. 